Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. Hi, I'm Iris Acker and I'm your host tonight. Now let's meet our panel before our guest. Let's say hello to Bill Hirschman, theater critic and founder of FloridaTheaterArts.com. Karen Stevens, an award-winning actress I like and writer. And Michael McKeever, who is an actor and a and our special guest today is Lewis J. Stadlin, an autobiography. You were so brave, so brave. It's an honest memoir. There's no question about that. <laughs> it's so honest. It's so honest, so honest. But let's talk about Lewis Stadlin, uh, who we were fortunate when we grabbed you when you were here doing Hello, Dolly. And you were kind enough to join us today and uh, talk about today and yesterday and yesterday and yesterday. You typify, typical, typical, that doesn't make sense, you typify theater actor, kind of an actor's actor. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, what's, I hear that, I heard that from other actors, Nathan Lane told me. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mentors. He's good too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Theater above all, why theater? Well, I, my father was an actor by the name of Alan Swift. I knew Alan. And he had, um, uh, he made his bones. He did a lot of theater, especially uh, in the second half of his life. But he was mostly on television. And uh, he ran a summer stock theater for one season, the Hyde Park Playhouse. And I remember as a 10-year-old sitting there watching this touring company of the pajama game. And I thought, Heinze, I'd like to play Heinze. Heinze. That's what it feels to me. And, and, and interestingly <laughs> enough, that is, that is the one musical comedy character uh, role that I have not played. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the girls. <laughs> that was it. Wow. These girls, you know. And uh, they were all right in front of me wearing mesh stockings and looking beautiful. <laughs> and then the people that appealed to me when I was a young boy were people like David Burns. A wonderful, wonderful actor. Howard died on Silver, stage. Howard Silver died on stage, <laughs> which is not a bad way to go, I oh suppose. <laughs> and I have played, ironically, many roles that David Burns uh, originated. So the theater is something, I've made 15 films, but they were never, uh, that spread out, out over a 45 year period. I never felt really accomplished enough. I didn't, I only had a number of large roles in maybe about three of those films. So I, I feel, I know, I'm more comfortable staring out at that black void, you know, when you're on stage uh, than any place else in my life. Comfort, I like that word, comfort. Television, you weren't very pleased with at all. Oh, California, you weren't pleased with. <laughs> You have to read the book. Oh, yeah. You have to read the book to hear about that. Can we spill a few things about? Let's start with California, and your. Uh, what was the series? It was ben called Benson. Benson. Yes. <laughs> and I. Seven-year contract. I watched but that wait, religiously. Yeah. I did too. Did Robert you? Yes. Yeah. I'm so excited to hear these stories. <laughs> well, better you should have watched it than to have been on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story that I, uh, that I, I, I did it because I had a, a, a setback, which changed the trajectory of my career. I did a play by Howard Sackler called Semmelweis, mm -hmm. and I was kind of screwed out of doing it when it was going to come to Broadway, but then it closed on the road, so it never did get to Broadway. So I decided, well, I'm going to do a TV series and make money and um, the, um, I felt that everybody was uh, dissembling and not telling the truth. For instance, uh, the producers would say, we're glad that we're not in the top 10 in mm -hmm. the Nielsen ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this. This is good to be in the top 30, because if you're in the top 10, there's no place to go but down, you know? <laughs> so I thought, oh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one day, and I, I want to make this quick, because I don't want this show to be about my, okay, uh, uh, my prison sentence on Benson <laughs> for a year. All right, I screened my way off of it. Bob Guillaume, they came in, and we were up against, uh, in the ratings on our time slot, uh, Flash Gordon or something, and the Waltons. Oh. But the Waltons were in their last breath. Mm -hmm. And our producer came to the table reading and said, 
we're going up against Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a that's a juggernaut, a ratings juggernaut. And we're gonna beat that. All right, then he left. And uh, I said uh, to Bob Guillaume, I said, no, we're not. We're not going to beat them in the ratings. He said, you know, you are so negative. Why are you saying that? I said, because he said it. And he <laughs> lies about everything. <laughs> so it can't be true. So he said, I will make you a $20 bet that we will beat Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeers. <laughs> now, there are two ratings. There's an overnight rating, which takes into consideration the people who watch TV in the major cities, the major markets. We were an urban sitcom. Mm -hmm. We would always have to win that one by 15 points. Then three days later, the whole country would come in, and the Waltons would come in close. So it was like the Democrats and the Republicans. The <laughs> Democrats, had, you had to win the city, or you'd lose, you know, because when the upstate came in, <laughs> you were toast, all right? So sure enough, the overnights come in, I go over to where they have the coffee and donuts, and I look and I see we've won by 13 ratings points, which means that we've probably lost by a couple of million. Right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now we go away for the weekend, we come back on Monday, and the whole ratings comes in, the Nielsen ratings. And Bob Guillaume said, did you, he make, makes a whole big scene, he said, did you or did you not say we were not going to beat Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer? I said, you know, I said, that we would not. We have a $20 bet. He said, give me the money. He said, we beat that. <laughs> so I got the money and gave it to him. And I thought, you know, if I was in Detroit, Chicago, any other city, and somebody told me that I lost a bet, I would just take them at their word. <laughs> but this is Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> and all I got to do is walk over to the coffee table with the donuts and look for myself. And sure enough, I went over there and I looked, and we lost. So we were up there at those reindeers. So I take Bob away. You know, I said, Bob, I said, you just made a whole big stink about how you took my money. We lost by two ratings points. He said, you really don't get it, do you? I said, what don't I get, Bob? He said, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is a ratings juggernaut. It destroys everything in its path. <laughs> this is what you got to listen to on a day-to-day -day basis when you're doing a sitcom, all right? He said, because we came in so close, that means that we beat them. <laughs> I said, Bob, nobody's going to tell me that coming in first is coming in second, and coming in second is coming in first. And I went home that night, and I thought, i got to get out of here. Well, uh, but you did. You've, if I remember correctly, you've, been, you've had three Tony nominations, is two. that correct? Two. For which, for, for which shows? Candide. Right. And a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Wow. But I, I do want to mention this, because this yeah. is uh, the two things that I'm most proud of. One is that I have my caricature up in Sardis, and I've had it for many years. Nice. The other is I just came back from the Gate Theatre in Ireland a year mm -hmm. ago, and I played uh, the furniture dealer Gregory Solomon in Arthur Miller's The Price. The Price yes. And I won the Irish Times Award, and I am the first American ever to win that award. Wow. And uh, that's the equivalent of the Irish Tony. So that also I'm very proud of. But I also oh, know that your father played the same role? He did, at the Caldwell At the Caldwell Theatre. Wow. It, how do you like that? Which is now the Wick Theatre. Yeah. Wow. Which I, and I, I didn't see him. I didn't see him play the role. I was on the road. You were so on the road at time. Road. But the happiest time of your life, from what I read in Awfully Funny, was three wonderful years doing The Producers. With Leroy Reams. With Leroy. Talk Amazing. about it. Talk about it. What was it like? Oh. Well, it was great. I, I mean, it was a great show. Uh, Nathan Lane had, uh, well, this is interesting, too. We were doing The Man Who Came to Dinner together, mm -hmm. and Nathan said, you know, they're offering me uh, <laughs> uh, Max Bialystok, and you want to play the German, you know, uh, writer? I said, no. I said, what do you want to do that show for? <laughs> he said, what do you mean? He said, it's Mel Brooks, it's Susan Stroman. I said, but you told me that you saw the production of The Music Man, and you didn't even know who to look at, and Susan Stroman directed that, and Mel, I've worked with Mel, I mean, Mel is, you know, he's <laughs> tough. I said, plus Zero Mostel, you're never going to be better, nobody's ever going to be better than Zero Mostel. He was definitive. <laughs> and he got really mad at me. Right? <laughs> well, then, my wife and I, we go and see uh, the next to last uh, preview, 
and it's great, you know. Yeah. And I go to Nathan's dressing room, and I get down on my knees, and I said, Nathan, Louis J. Stadlin is wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> now he calls me up and says, would you like to take over for me when I leave? And I said, no, I would not like to take over. I would like to do the national company. And he went, now why would you want to do that? And I, I said, well, first of all, I love the road. And I don't want to go into rehearsal in a vacuum. I want it to be my company. And I want a five-week rehearsal process. This is a complicated piece. So I went and I auditioned uh, for Mel and got it. But because of, uh, after 750 performances of Susan Stroman's effortless choreography, <laughs> I had a complete hip replacement. <laughs> but, but it was a great show. That's great right. show. wonderful. And going way, way back, really, Minnie's Boys was the first Broadway show? It was my first Broadway show, yes. Groucho Marx. Mm -hmm. uh, which has, you have been the Groucho Marx ever since. I mean, that's been it. And working with Shelley Winters, there's got to be a story there that you want to share. We should At explain, least this is a musical that was written about the Marx Brothers and how they came oh, yes. together. That's true, I should. For the civilians should and the audience. I expect everybody <laughs> in my audience to know what I'm talking about. Um, Shelley was a, a, a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> as, simple, as simple as that. Oh, no, there's got to be more to it than oh, yeah. It must be a story. <laughs> well, one of the things that didn't help matters was this was the year that Catherine Hepburn was in Coco, mm -hmm. Lauren McCall was in Applause with Leroy Reams, and Shelley Winters was in Minnie's Boys. So it wasn't just enough for Shelley to be good. She felt she was in some sort of a beauty contest with these other two divas. <laughs> she, she was in over her head. But the problem was it, with Minnie's Boys, and I know Iris has played this role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it was written in the style of Gypsy, but Gypsy is not about Gypsy Rose Lee. Gypsy mm -hmm. is about a mother and the effect that she has on her two daughters. Mm -hmm. Minnie's Boys, the only conflict in Minnie's Boys was, were the Marx Brothers ever going to make it big in show business? <laughs> so that there was very little conflict. And Shelley, uh, she just, um, uh, in the second act, they were, they were making her part smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> right? And they had this final <laughs> terrible number that they had in the second act. Who'd have thought we'd ever be hearing from Minnie's boys? And Shelley, like, didn't sing it. She didn't dance it. They just had these two dancers dragging her all over the stage <laughs> as if it was Hello, Dolly. But it wasn't Hello, Dolly. It was this terrible number. At any rate, it was great. I met Groucho. Groucho and I became very good friends. It was a very interesting relationship we had. Um, he used to come and see me in every show that I did. Wow. And um, he, for, while he lived, uh, he wouldn't allow anybody else to play him. And I kind of incarnated him, you know. Mm. And uh, I had to say to him, he, he called me up, I was doing a play at the uh, public theater, because certain reviewers said after Minnie's Boys, well, he's great in this, but maybe he's just some imitator that they found under a rock, and this is what he does. <laughs> so I was very sensitive to take something that was as far from Groucho Marx as possible. So uh, I remember Groucho called me, and he said, uh, "Do you? Uh, I hear that you don't want to do the, uh, the this uh, uh, TV series." I said, well, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, is it because you would rather I go, you, I go with this producer instead of this producer? And I realized I could make a lot of money. And I was only 24 years old. And I said, Groucho, you're a genius. And I do a really good performance playing you because I'm a, a good young actor. But I have to carve my own identity. And I just can't continue playing you. And he completely understood. You work with some people who are considered legends. I mean, just sitting here listening yeah. to you say you talked on the phone with Groucho, you know. What, what is that like as far as when looking back on your, your overall career? I mean, what, what does that feel like? I guess that's what I'm trying to well, okay. I want to pre premise what I'm going to say with, I had this great acting teacher, Stella Adler. 
And I'm 18 years old, and she said, darling, she said, what do you want to be? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to be a star? And I thought, well, well that's a silly question. Because if you're a star, you get all the good parts. And it was not until about 10 or 15 years later that I realized what she was talking about. Make no mistake about it. People who are stars dedicate their lives to being stars. They have a, their identity is caught up on being at the very top of the pecking order. And after a while, I thought, I don't want to do this. I just want to be an actor. And the idea that, you know, my colleagues can say I'm an actor's actor, I take great pride in that. When I did The Producers, I had it in my contract that my name was above the title of the play on every marquee. And we played 20 uh, cities. And I remember looking at that and saying, this is great. I'm really glad that, and I got a really good salary, that I, I have achieved what stars have achieved without dedicating my life to it. Um, <laughs> so let's start with somebody like Paul Newman. Paul Newman yes. was a great actor to work with. It was a privilege. And he also lived the, the most wonderful life, giving, you know, all the, the Newman, you know, uh, uh, camps for kids with cancer and, yeah. and giving all of, of the profits of his food company to mm -hmm. charity. He was really a great guy. And um, I had a wonderful scene with him in The Verdict. And Sidney Lumet, who was a great director, was the director. I had done Serpico with him a number of years before that. And Sidney, what he would do is he would direct the film like it was a play. And we were at 890 Broadway, and we would do run-throughs of the entire screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I had to be this guy in The Verdict, in which I was this high-powered surgeon who convinces Paul Newman, who is a drunk, to take on this case against the uh, Catholic Archdiocese. And Sidney had it planned where it would be a long tracking shot. So he had Paul Newman and I walking around this, this uh, uh, big rehearsal room. Well, I was very excited to be working with Paul Newman, so I kept stopping and making eye contact. And he said, no, no, <laughs> let him catch up to you. He's a drunk. You're a very famous surgeon. Well, I, I just, you know, couldn't do it for about five <laughs> days. And then finally he took me aside. And he said, I'm going to clean this up. He said, look, you're having an affair with a 20-year-old intern in a hospital in Cambridge. You have two hours to get into your Jaguar, drive across the Charles River, make love to her, and then come back and operate on somebody else. You have two hours. I never looked back at Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> some, people, some people locally will go, I know that face. I know that name. You did, how long were you at the Coconut Grove Playhouse in that? Talk a little bit about where people that might well remember you from. Well, I did do this Groucho A Life in Review. Yes. And I, again, I was very sensitive. I only did it outside of New York. I had put together my own Groucho show, which I toured all over the country. And there were producers who wanted to do it in New York. I wouldn't do it. And I got to be friends with Arnold Middleman. And uh, then I did a two-character play called Just Desserts, written by a guy named Tom Dulock. Uh -huh. And um, it was me and this guy, Steve Arlen. And it was about an enraged actor <laughs> who was so furious at a drama critic because he's written these horrible reviews <laughs> that he kidnaps him, ties him up in a wheelchair, blindfolds him, <laughs> and then does all these, you know, I do the uh, crisp and crispy speech from uh, Henry V. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretending that I'm eight actors, oh, all right? Great. Well, when that's I great. came down, and we did that in the alternative space, and the it ran... The Encore Theater, it was yeah, called. It ran forever. It wouldn't close. It, it <laughs> would not close, all right? At any rate, I was very sick with a sinus infection when I came down there in rehearsal. And when it's a two-character play, yeah, you get no time off. You're on right. all the time. And uh, I was so sick, and I just couldn't get over this thing. And then one day, the playwright, Tom Dulac, and Arnold Middleman, they were sitting there, and they were having this in-depth discussion, the gestalt of this play. And I was so happy. I thought, oh, just let them talk and talk. And talk. 
<laughs> and the discussion was, how great an actor is Tyrone Cross? That's the name of the character, Tyrone Cross. Is he as good as Marlon Brando? Is he as good as Robert De Niro? And as much as I wanted them to talk about this into the night, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I said, why don't we make him as good a actor as I am? <laughs> because I'm not as good an actor as Marlon Brando or Robert De Niro. <laughs> <laughs> really, Bob. Let's really, Bob. You are so, you are Gosh. so wonderfully funny. Is that something that you can learn? That you develop the technique, or is it just something that comes naturally? Uh, Stella Adler would say, "You can't teach that. You can't teach that." Uh, you know, it takes uh, Sam Levine, who was a mentor of mine. We did the Sunshine Boys together, and I loved Sam Levine. And Sam Levine was a deeply serious man. And uh, I've always felt it takes a serious man to be a really good comic. Mm -hmm. Somebody like Burt Law, <laughs> genius, you know, but Burt Law was, you know, insanely serious, you know. I mean, the poor man didn't know that The Wizard of Oz was a hit until 1965. <laughs> <laughs> that could take a toll on a person, right? All right. Um, it, uh, you, I have learned certain things in the interim. One of the, uh, and Jerry Zachs, who I've done like five or six shows with, I was doing uh, Nathan Detroit in the National Company of Guys and Dolls. And there's a long exposition scene. And in the beginning of the scene, I say to my two cohorts, I said, you know what date today is? It's uh, uh, Adelaide and my 14th wedding anniversary. And I didn't get her anything, you know. So later, she comes in and she goes, oh, Nathan, Nathan, you know, I bought you this and I gave you this. A belt. A, a belt, a belt, you know. <laughs> uh, roses are red, violets, something about jelly is in the title, I don't remember. Yeah, yes. And then I had to say something along the lines about, uh, uh, oh, and sweetheart, you know, I saw a gold bracelet with a so-and-so, so-and-so, and she said, oh, Nathan, you shouldn't, and then I, I go, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was doing it like I was... Uh, guilty. And Jerry Zach said, no, 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 no. No, be as optimistic as you possibly can. And honey, I got you this and a diamond bracelet and, and oh, Nathan, you shouldn't have. I didn't. Exactly. <laughs> now, it's funnier when the pie hits you in the face and the audience can't see it coming. Yes. If you become contemplative about comedy, you let the air out of the balloon. Yes. Sure. It has to be positive. Everything's going to work out great. And then, boom, the joke. Yes. So you pick up things like that along the line. But I think people either have a talent to be funny. You look at somebody, we were talking about Vanessa Redgrave, who's, you know, unbelievable. Great actress. Not funny. Mm -mm. As great as she is, she just does, she's not funny. She doesn't have the funny gene. Now, Maggie Smith, Yeah. there's nobody funny in the whole exactly. world. And she can, you know, play tragedy with the best of them. But you do it all. Well, you know, if, if I had been allowed to do that Semmelweis, my career would have had a different trajectory. And people would have said that I can do things that are serious, you know. You, I know your review, but the Times came to see it, did they not? Yeah, they did, yeah. When you did it in Albany? I did it in Buffalo. Oh, but it was close. <laughs> it was close. Well, there's 400 miles between them. <laughs> but they're both cold. They have that in common. They are. So, um, Yes, and you got these phenomenal reviews, and then they replaced you. Yes. In... Because you weren't a name. And it they was replaced going to Broadway. Some, replaced... And after he got these rave uh, reviews and everything, they said, oh, by the way, uh, thank you very much, but no thanks. We brought in this guy that we saw in London or something. He was brilliant. He came in. He was a disaster. Huh. Am I right? And what happened was they said, by the way, we're not using him after all. Lewis. We'd like you to do it. And what did you do? Uh, well, I went in there, and the actor that we're talking about was a very fine actor, Colin Blakely. Oh, yeah. And Howard Sackler, who was kind of an artistic fascist, he said, I wrote it for Colin. <laughs> and uh, now they call me up, and they said, will you take over? They opened to not such good reviews in Washington at the Kennedy Center. And to make a long story short, I said, yeah. I said, you know, I sued them. Mm -hmm. and said that they could not bring him in. And it was a three-hearing process, and I won the first two and lost the last one. And uh, I said, I know what Colin Blakely makes. He makes 
$2,000. And if you want me to come in and play this part, you will pay me $2,001. <laughs> and they walked away. The director and the playwright walked away from the production and they closed out of town. Mm. Besides Heinze, that is there a that. part that you're dying, you really mm -hmm. wish you could play? Or either one that got away from you or one that you Well, I always away wanted to play yet. a little chap. And, really? And, uh, oh, really? It because he was my favorite. Oh. No, he was my, Anthony Newley mm. was my idol. And right. stop the world, I want and to stop get the world. I would go, uh, I used to go to dance class at Variety Arts. Do you remember Variety Arts Studios? On yes, 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 yes. So it's a parking lot now. And I, after the dance class, I, I would go to uh, uh, see Anthony Newley, and I'd be walking around like, I was 14, and I remember two women came over and she said, you seem to be somebody who's connected with this show. <laughs> I said, yes, I am Mr. Newley's understudy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And if you want to hear more stories <laughs> like that, the book is acting foolish as he usually does. <laughs> and uh, you can get it on Amazon. Got mine on Amazon mm. as well. And um, meanwhile, we hope you won't forget us here every week. Uh, if it's not Lou Staddle, it'll be somebody almost as good. They can't be as good as him. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for watching. I thank my panel. And Lewis, I thank you so much for it's being here today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. If you me. want to know what else is going on in theater today, just go to floridatheateronstage.com. Oh, and please go to the theater.